Hey everybody, greetings from the United States of America. It's so good to be here to be with my parents a little bit. It's been a while since I've seen them, so I'm just enjoying uh, some time with them. And um, welcome to the global broadcast. The message I'm going to be sharing with you today, uh, I actually preached it uh, a couple days ago here at a local Messianic congregation. And um, unfortunately, the video is not available, so it's just audio. And I thought about reproducing it here, but th there was just a level, there's just a different dynamic when there is a group of people. And, and God gave unusual grace. Uh, I wasn't quite sure we could recreate it. There was a special anointing, uh, you know, uh, there was just a real rawness, if you will. You'll know what I mean when you listen to it. Uh, the message is about the fact that your defeat does not define you. And it certainly doesn't define your destiny. Life is messy. Everyone goes through difficult things. The, the, the perfect family, I have not found. Perfect congregation, I have not found. And there are uh, real tragedies and difficulties that we pass through in this uh, journey as we look forward to that eternal kingdom that we're going to be a part of forever and ever and ever. So I hope this blesses you. I want to encourage you to go ahead and like this broadcast and to share it with your friends. Uh, but most importantly, I want you to be encouraged and be strengthened in Yeshua's name. God bless you. And I will see you guys again very, very soon. Bye-bye. So I got about 20 minutes here and I want to encourage you. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we just ask for grace, for revelation, for identity. Help us to understand who we are in you, O oh God. I pray that you would erase from us every false understanding of who we are and that we would understand that we are seated with Messiah in heavenly places. I pray that you would encourage everyone here that's going through a difficulty, confusing time in life, oh God. I just pray that you would break through in Yeshua's name. Amen. Life is messy. I, I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Life brings with it many different challenges. It is not porcelain pretty uh, and no chips, no, you know, uh, uh, no scars, no scuffs. It's not like that. If you live life, then you understand that you go through difficulties in this life. There's nowhere in the Bible that Yeshua promises us an easy life. If you come to me and confess me a savior, then you will have a perfect life. That's not what the Bible says. It talks about suffering. It talks about per persecution. And then it talks about you know, some of the mysteries, things that we don't understand. There are difficulties that we go through in this life. I have a friend just the other day. I, I, I open up Facebook and I find out that he's been separated from his wife for a year and now divorced. Never told me. I, we're not that close of friends that maybe he didn't feel he needed to, but... It's not the point. The point is, is that when he got married, he did not think he would ever get divorced. We've all gone through, again, I'm not prophesying or encouraging you that divorce is okay. I don't think, I don't think God doesn't enjoy divorce at all. But one thing I've realized is that people get divorced. Sometimes people I love and respect. By the way, the key, the key, if you want to know the key to having a great marriage, is my wife here? <laughs> the key, it's really simple to have a good marriage. You need two people that are willing to die to their own desires. That, that really is, I mean, honestly, that's, that's, that's it. If you can get to the, the problem is it's really hard to find two people who are willing to say, my life is not my own anymore. I have another friend in ministry, somewhat well-known. Wife just left him. Shock. Dev Life is messy. I remember when I walked through with Dan and Patty Juster back in, in 1998. I got a phone call at 5 in the morning. It was from Joe Miller. 
uh, uh, Jerry Miller's wife, and she said there's been a tragedy next to the Juster's house. It, it, it's Sammy, and he, 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 there was a, a fire. And I remember hanging up the phone thinking, that's not real. Like my mind would not let me believe that anything bad, I'm going to find out in an hour or so that everybody is fine. Except it didn't work out that way. And their son Sammy died. Why? Who knows? Should we, should we pick people's lives apart to find? The, the, the point is, is that life is messy. And I, I'm going to dare say that all of you know what I'm talking about. With our parents, with our children, disappointments, with our spouses. But here's the beauty of it. Your defeats do not define you. We are defined by the fact that we're children of God. Just a few other examples. John Wesley. John Wesley is one of my heroes. Great revivalist. Uh, uh, one of the main leaders, the main leader of the, of the first great awakening. Used to preach in England before tens of thousands of coal miners. They would be weeping and crying at his hardened, hardened, tough guys, you know, weeping and crying as the Spirit of God would touch the heart. He was amazing, but you know what? He got married. He got married to a woman named Molly. And Molly was very difficult. She would confront him while he was preaching. She wrote articles against him. She at one point pulled him by his hair as he's leaving the house to go preach and, and had a clump of hair. I mean, she was, but this is John Wesley. I mean, the, one of the greatest theologians in 2,000 years of the Ecclesia. John Wesley going through that great tragedy in his life, being married to someone who did not just not love him, but was suspicious of him and attacked him. Yeah, but not in the Bible. You know, that's John Wesley. He's, he, you know, that's, but look at the great heroes of the Bible. Yeah, yeah, they never had problems. How about King David? King David was a man after God's own heart. He loved God, and yet he had some challenges in life. He marries a woman who's given to him in marriage because of defeating Goliath and then killing a bunch of Philistines, who is the daughter of a Nut job king, demon possessed. Michal, that was her name. Can you imagine how she felt, by the way? Yeah, we're gonna give you to this guy because he 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 got the foreskins of a bunch of Philistines. Okay, now you're married to him. But then she she loves him. She's in love with David, but but she's got this wicked father, and he she, now I gotta choose. Do I do I help my dad defeat David or do I and so she helps David escape, but then she's given in marriage to somebody else, but then David goes and gets her back later. See, Michal, forget David for a minute. Let's just talk about Michal. She had a hard life. And we judge that poor woman. We do. We read the story about David coming in to Jerusalem. He's dancing. He's worshiping. He's twirling. He wasn't naked, by the way. That is not correct. Because that would be really weird. And she stands at her window and she judges him. Do you realize what that woman has been through in life? Now she's looking at all the young girls worshiping, loving David. And what does he do? See, I think David made a mistake. He comes upstairs into the kingdom. I don't know if there's stairs or elevator or escalator. But he gets up there somehow, rope, <laughs> climbs up there. And he's there with his wife. And she says something snarky to him. And he says something snarky back. I'm willing to act like a fool because I love you. You ever met zealous people like that, Rabbi, right? You know, sometimes us, when I was a new believer, I was a little bit like that. It's great to have zeal. It's better to have zeal and wisdom. <laughs> and I think David was a little bit lacking wisdom in that moment. And, and, and his zeal level was great. His wisdom level wasn't. And what does he say to her? He says... You know, I, I'm willing to act like a fool because I love God and all you, you need to meet people like that. But what if he did that and she was barren? He cursed her. She was barren the rest of her life. What if he had said, what if he had walked over to that woman? Because life is messy, people. Marriage is messy. 
There's, there was a time in my life with my lovely, beautiful wife, Ilana, where I thought we would never make it. I would love to tell you that I got married at 23 years old, I think. And I was just the best husband and she was the best wife. And we've got a perfect family and we've never gone through anything difficult. And there are a lot of preachers out there would love you to think that about them. But what value is there to me to lie to you? Can God not see through my lies? The fact of the matter is, is that I didn't think we we're going to make it. I was arrogant. I did not know how to love another person. And I married a strong-willed new believer Israeli. <sighs> you can't even imagine. I was teaching her about how wives submit to their husbands. She's like, yeah, right. That's our, but where, where's that in the Bible? <laughs> but we had a hard time. And I remember one day just thinking, and, and I come from the background, I come from the, 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 the mentality is that if, you, if, if, you, if, if your marriage falls apart, you're done in ministry. I was just beginning in ministry. You know, I come from the idea that if you can't get that one thing right, then, then you probably shouldn't be preaching to other people. And I remember thinking, I'm, I'm done. And I remember saying to God, if it, 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 life was it messy. It wasn't where I thought it was going to be three years before that when I married her. I'll get back to David. I have not forgotten him or Michal. <laughs> when I said I do and she said I do, I never dreamed 30 years later we'd be on the verge, verge of maybe getting a divorce. Now we weren't really, but we were mad at each other. We went through a month. I, don't, I think it was about a month we didn't talk to each other. Our kids were too young to know that we weren't talking to each other. I did a wedding. I did a wedding. I officiated a wedding and my wife was not talking to me. Hey, I'm just I'm being real. <laughs> Thank you for that one person who appreciates that. <laughs> but it's messy. It's hard. I remember I, I have this ring that's kind of hard to get off. Um, which is good. And it says, Ahavalo Tibole Olam, which, as you all know, is 1 Corinthians 13 8. Love never fails. I always wanted that to be a reminder to me. If I walk in love, it's going to work out. If I do what love would do, things are going to be good between me and my wife. Well, I remember we were married about two years, something like that. And, and, and I, take, I don't take it off anymore, mostly because I got fatter. I was 132 pounds when I got married. Can you believe that? I don't even know how this thing stayed on my finger. But I took it off and I couldn't find it. I could not find it. And months go by. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, you will find your ring when you learn to love your wife. We go to this retreat thing. It wasn't a, a, it was a retreat center, but we were just there. The two of us, we had a great time. It was wonderful. I think we were married two years at this time, three years. And uh, the Lord speaks to me on the way home. He says, okay, good. You, 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 you're, not that you've passed 100%, but you're, you're now moving in that right direction. You'll find your ring. I get home. It was under my bed for six months. I mean like a foot, like in plain view. That day that God said, you'll find. So life is messed. So here's David and he's, oh, I'll dance in front of everybody and they may love me and you may not. And I don't care because I love God. Sounds good, right? Sounds good. I've met so many people like that. They know the right zealous thing to say, but their life is a mess. Now, David, I'm not saying your life is a mess. But imagine if he had walked over to that bitter, angry woman who at one point was in love with him and he put his arms around her and he said I know you've been hurt I know you grew up in a very difficult home you were taken from me I took you I know it's hard I know how it different you, you, you hear what I'm saying but he just got all he, in his fake zeal he responded unrighteously. What's my point? My point is that life is hard. Life is messy. There are difficulties. Kids not serving God. Siblings not talking to each other. Deaths. Life is not 
Perfect. But the key is to find your identity, not in your defeats, but in him. I, I, I remember back in, I guess it was uh, 2000. I don't remember. I was, remember I was a pastor at King of Kings and, in Jerusalem, and there were just, just nothing was going right in my life. Outwardly, yes. Outwardly, people, oh, look at you. You moved to, to Israel. Now you're in Jerusalem. Now you're, you're pastoring. You know, it's an English-speaking congregation, but, but one of the largest congregations in the country. Inwardly, I was miserable. Difficulties, my kids adjusted to Israeli life. I felt like an absolute failure. And part of my problem is that I was, look, I was defining myself by what was happening in my life, not by what is written about me. I am who you say I am. I am a child of God. By the way, I was writing down that. I was thinking about that theme when you guys played that song. I am who you say I am. And, and, and so what I did is I was miserable. I was at, in, in, in my parents' house. I was in Richmond at the time. And I was in, the, in my dad's study. And I was just crying out to God. And I, I was so broken after six months of listening to the enemy. Telling me, you are a failure. You've got these people fooled. I said to myself, I, I don't know what to do. And I, I started having a conversation with myself. And it went like this. Well, you're, you're, you're listening to lies. Okay, yeah, okay, I get that. I'm listening to lies. But listen, this is somebody who is, you know, educated, Bible preaching, and, and, and I said, this is what I said to myself, but I don't know where to find the truth. That's how beat up I was. That's how, beat, how, how life had taken its toll on me that I didn't, you know, I didn't go, oh, of course, well, let's get the word of God out here. I literally said, I don't know where to find the truth. And then, of course, very, you know, like a Google search, 0. 0.200 seconds. I was like, wait, the Bible. And I took out the Bible and I wrote a confession of faith for my life. I was so beat up. But I wrote down this confession and it wasn't a name. It wasn't like I'm going to have a private jet and, and I'm going to be a millionaire. And I'm going to have, it, it wasn't, I mean, be nice to be a millionaire. But those aren't my goals in life. My goal, your goal, our goal is to fulfill the call of God on our lives. And I began to write down this confession. I am blessed. God loves me. And I, I wrote down scriptures, you know, that talk about being free of sin. I wrote down scriptures about, about my marriage. I wrote down scriptures about pride. I wrote down scriptures. And I, every day I began to read and say, I will, I will consider, in humility, I will consider others better than myself. That's, that's probably the most important thing you can learn as you're going into ministry is that your job is not to be served, but to serve. As a young youth pastor, I was like, all right, we can have a little clap there. As a young youth pastor, I was thinking, all right, it's my time. These kids are here to serve me. And I learned that it wasn't that way at all. In humility, consider others better than you cannot lose if you go in that direction. And I began to write about who I am in Yeshua. Because think of all the different labels that the enemy throws at us. You're unloved. You're an addict. You're bitter. You're an alcoholic. You're ugly. You're stupid. All these labels. No, I am a child of God. I am loved by God. I am loved by Yeshua. That's who I am. I am a dude who is broken, trying to figure out life, but at the same time seated with God in heavenly places. Messiah in heavenly places. Enjoying his glow on my life. Receiving it by faith. And why do, you, why do I say by faith? Because it takes faith to get stuff from God. Now he's, oh, I don't believe in all that faith stuff. Well, read the Bible. You cannot be a believer without faith. A faithless person is not a saved person. It takes faith to come to God. 
and say, I believe that Yeshua died for me. That is faith. And it takes faith to walk with God because when everything in life is telling you that he's left you, that you can still cry out to God and say, I don't care. This has happened and that has happened, but you love me. Like Job, who lost everything and still said, the Lord gives, the Lord take it away. Blessed it be, blessed be the name of the Lord. I have a friend who, he was in his early 40s, he was, he was a specimen. <laughs> he was tall, he was fit. He used to run marathons almost weekly. He would, very wealthy, would go to other, other places around the country and run marathons, take his family, everything perfect. And then, I don't know, 10 years ago, so he, he, he was diagnosed with some sort of a condition and he could no longer exercise. And when you, you can't exercise, you tend to put on weight and, and doesn't look like he used to look. Doesn't look anymore like the specimen. And I was praying, I was in Colorado in a car one day. Um, it's a whole nother story while I was there, but I'm driving from one place to the next and it, it was, I was, had an unusual experience with the Lord. And he starts speaking to me about different friends of mine. And then he spoke to me about this guy. And he says, you tell him that one of the reasons he had to go through this is because his identity was in, this is who I am. But God was saying, I'm bringing you down. I'm breaking you until you understand that your identity is child of God. And now he's in ministry. And he's, he, he's, again, he doesn't look like he used to, but he's at peace with who he is and he's loving people and ministering to people. We have to find our identity in God. It's not in being a professional. It's not in being smart. It's not in degrees. As in academic degrees, it's not in your talents. We like to say things like, well, you know, when we get to heaven or when heaven comes to earth, which is more my theology, this person who we didn't suspect, they may be ahead of you, but you know what? They really might be, and they probably will be. Because God does not measure us by the stuff that we've done. He measures us by what we did with the grace we were given. And the way you were able to move, listen, there are people who are doing incredible things for the kingdom of God because they have to. They're driven, they're pushed. I have friends, I see them getting older. And as you get older, one of the things you, you, you go through is you begin, if you're a driven person, you begin to look at your legacy. What, what have I really done? It, it can break you. At 65, 75, 80 years old, you begin to look back with regret. I didn't do enough. I got to do more. I got a little time left. Instead of saying, hey, God, <laughs> it's been fun walking with you all these years. You know, I probably didn't do everything I could have done, but you know what? That's okay. You can't live life like that. Just the other day, um, I guess about a week ago, uh, Bill Johnson, who is the uh, pastor of Bethel uh, out in Reading. And, and listen, there's a lot of people, different people with a lot of different uh, opinions about him. To be quite honest with you, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon he's preached or read a book that he's written. This is not about endorsing or not endorsing his teaching. It's about the fact that his wife died of cancer. And, and this is what he wrote or, sh or shared about three days afterwards with his congregation. He said, what I found is there are measures of his presence that you can only find in the valley, in the shadow of the valley of death, valley of the shadow of death. He's not a vending machine. I don't get to put a quarter in and get out what I want. It's a relational journey. I've experienced his kindness, his miracles at levels I never earned or deserved. I just don't have the right to reevaluate what he is like 
because I have experienced loss. In other words, we don't get to redefine God because we got in a car accident or because we suffered a miscarriage or a divorce. Maybe you didn't want the divorce. Maybe you fought. You fought, you wanted, but it still happened. And then God, we don't get to reevaluate God. God's goodness, and I'm closing right here in a minute. God's goodness has been demonstrated to us for all time in the death of his son. Once he allowed Yeshua to take our sin upon him, there, there is no other act that he can do to prove his goodness to us. And now we live life in this broken world trying to bring this message to other people to take them along with us. But we're in a war. We're in a battleground. And it's hard. And yet there's victory. Let me keep reading. May I never be found critiquing God when things don't go my way. May I always be found having a heart ready to be critiqued by him. Is God my friend? He is, but he is first my Lord. And I'll never have the pain I'm feeling right now in eternity. So in this moment, it is a privilege to respond rightly to the Lord of my life with deeper trust and devotion. I will bow before the Lamb on the throne in awe and worship of him forever. But never will I have the face-to-face chance to do that while I'm in pain. So in this moment, I choose to do that. When I said yes to Jesus, I gave up my right to fully understand or be in charge of my life. You see, that's the test right there. In the midst of the death of a loved one, a broken marriage, a child in rehab, in the midst of having to step out of ministry because of a failure, in the midst of those things, can you get up and say, I worship you? I wor-. What, that, 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 there's a profound revelation there. In, in eternity, when the kingdom of God is established on earth and Yeshua is king over all the world, and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of God, and we are changed and we have glorified bodies, and we go to worship him, it won't be a struggle. You won't be in Jerusalem in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16, where he talks about the nations, coming to Jerusalem to worship the king. You won't be there going, did, did you feel anything? It was kind of a boring meeting, right? I, it's kind of dead, right? No, it's going to, you're going to have a new body. It's going to be constant on. No depression, no fear, no sickness. But in the midst of a world filled with fear, depression, sickness, and again, I believe in the promises of God, and I believe in walking in victory, and I'm always expecting God to heal me, to bless me, to bless my marriage, and bless my kids, and bless my, I'm always expecting blessing, but I'm, I've lived life, I know it doesn't always work that way. So in the midst of the pain, Can we lift up our hands and say, we love you, Yeshua. We don't get it. We don't understand it. We don't like it. We don't want it. But in the midst of it, we are choosing in my pain. I am sharing in your suffering. You see, that's a fellowship right there. Not many people want to go there. There is a fellowship of sharing in his suffering. That Paul said, hey, I want to know the power of his resurrection, but also to share in the fellowship of his sufferings. Amen? Amen. Now, I imagine that there are folks here today that are going through difficult things, that life might be screaming at you, God God has left you, God doesn't love you, it's over, you're rejected. And I want to minister to you right now. We're not going to take a long time. But... If you're going through something like that, just go ahead and stand up. I'm standing up. I battle daily. Satan says to me every day, you're a failure. God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. It's a daily battle to live in the truth of God's word. Lord, in the midst of difficulties, of hardship, We choose to worship you. We say that you are good. 
Lord, I know everything going on in my life. You know everything going on in their lives. And we choose right now to say we love you. Just say it out loud. I love you, Lord. I love you, Yeshua. You are good. You are gracious. Let that be your confession. And who are you? You're a child of God. You're not defined by defeats. You're defined by what Yeshua did on the cross for you. And he did that because of his incredible, unceasing, boundless love for you. Amen.